welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Uh, give me a call, 208-991-4783, and uh, become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Uh, today's episode of the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio is brought to you by the support of our listeners. Thank you so much for your support. This week's episode of Let George Do It's a little bit different because we don't have Bob Bailey in the lead. Uh, due to an illness, Bailey was not able to appear in this show, and the role went to Ken Peters. Those of you who listened to Dragnet and paid really close attention may recall Peters was actually uh, played one of the fill-in partners for Joe Friday. Uh, during the space between Ben, Marrero, ben Romero and Frank Smith. He was best known, uh, perhaps, for his roles on This Man's Family, Carlton Morse's long-time running soap opera. After he f- finished his acting career, he dropped out of acting in the 60s, uh, he, uh, he uh, began a second career as a minister. Ken Peters was actually a stage name. His real name was Ken Fagerlin. Uh, on uh, Life of Luigi, he played the role of Olsen, who was uh, Swedish. That was notice, uh, notable because all the other actors were playing people of different ethnicities than themselves. But Fagerlin was playing someone who was actually Swedish. All right, well, I, I got a little bit on uh, Ken Peters uh, slash Ken Fagerlin. So here now is today's episode of Let George Do It. Knock on wood. Personal notice. Danger is my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you've got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Oil Company of California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invite you to Let George Do It. Knock on Wood, another adventure of George Valentine. My dear Mr. Valentine, I need your assistance most desperately. I am a landlord. Oh, yes, one of those poor malign creatures who happen to own a building. Happen to? No, no, I'll be honest. It's my life, the culmination of my desire, my only love. And I'm sure you'll forgive my sentimentality when you realize it is none other than the Alfred J. Liggett Golden Tower Apartment Building. Oh, yes. I am Alfred J. Liggett. Well, Mr. Valentine, a person of much lesser achievement is threatening my horizon. To be blunt about it, my very reputation itself is in imminent danger. Please come quickly. I am desperate. Never in my life has my entire fortune been so threatened. You see, I have been a very lucky man. <laughs> Knock on wood. I'm sure this is the right door. Knock louder, George. Yeah. yeah pretty plush around here. <laughs> it's a quiet house, mister. No need to make a lot of racket. Huh? Boss will hear you. No need for excitement. Are you the janitor? Guess you dropped that cigarette wrapper by mistake. Oh, no, we didn't drop anything. Try to keep it nice and clean. Tenants like it that way. No pets or children, you know. Waste basket at the end of every hall in case you have any more trouble. Oh, uh, Mr. Lake. Oh, uh, Mr. Valentine and Miss Brooks. Come in, come in quickly, please. Yes, sir. Uh, sure. We've just been blackballed by your janitor. And Newton. Oh, he's a wonderful fellow. Salt of the earth. Old-fashioned conscientiousness. 
You don't find them like that anymore. It keeps everything clean as a whistle, night and day. I can imagine. The Golden Tower must be a very a homey place to live. Why, thank you, Miss Brooks. Oh, yes, yes, indeed. We pride uh, ourselves Mr. Along. Liggett, uh, w- what's your problem? You wrote you've got trouble. What is it? Mr. Valentine, it's the 15th floor, apartment A. Oh, my. I'm at a complete loss. Well? Um... I made a dreadful mistake two months ago when I leased it. And now he's come back again. He goes away for a time, but now he's come back again. Mr. Valentine, I tell myself nothing will happen. I've always been very lucky. <laughs> Knock on wood. But no, no, it's gone beyond mere hoping. What has? Who has? What are you talking about? To be quite blunt, I am persecuted and beset by an undesirable tenant. Oh. But the complaint isn't really mine, you understand. I'm a tolerant. Oh, I'm very tolerant. Well, I'm sure you are. But it's the tenant in 16A, the next floor, right over him. And there's the rub. Uh, look, Mr. Liggett, you, you've lost me. One of my oldest tenants, 16A, a most delightful woman. So wealthy, but no sham, no pretense. And naturally, I must consider her first, mustn't I? You've got problems. You figure them out. <laughs> Mr. Valentine, listen. If she complains, and I don't blame her for complaining. This man who lives under her, he's a lot more than just a trial and a nuisance. But what on earth could you expect us to do? Well, he's a lot bigger than I am. Uh, bigger than nuisance. Uh, both of us roll together. I want you to talk to the lady. That's Mrs. Fairchild. And then talk to him. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Liggett, but this... This just... man is a criminal. Doesn't that interest you? A criminal? Yes, yes, he is. Since he swindled me into a lease, I've discovered he's actually been to prison. Yes, twice. He's a gambler. He's notorious. And to have him right here in my beloved tower, he calls himself Side Bet Sinclair. Oh, Side Bet Sinclair. Ah, his name does mean something. Oh, yes, there, you see. And Mr. Valentine, this, this person has clearly stated that if Mrs. Fairchild dares to complain about him once more, he will wring her neck like a chicken. Excuse the bathrobe, lady. Would have worn my good one if I'd have known you was coming. One with eggs Benedict on it. <laughs> uh, you get up a little late, Mr. Sinclair. Uh, so do your jokes. Well, I live like a king. What do you think? Bend us hand I need a cleaned up. That to collect a few debts, that's all. Why not enjoy yourself? Only live once. <laughs> you should see my bathroom. That's my office. Oh, I tell you, I never had it so good. Yeah, well, I'm only here because I'm sucker enough to... Because of her up there, old lady Fairchild? <laughs> Boy, have I got those people buffaloed. What did she say about me? Well, we decided to reverse the order and ask you first. I can imagine you're not much to live over. <laughs> ring her neck. I'll ring her neck. That's what I'll do. I'm straight with the law, Valentine. Everybody's happy except the ones who owe me money. Oh, now relax. Have a bottle of soda pop. I beg your pardon? I got an ulcer. Serve root beer at parties. <laughs> Big, riotous underworld parties. And you know what they're like. You've been to boogies. Is that a complaint? You know what she does? She knocks like this. Raps on the floor, see? With her key. I tell you, it kills people. You wouldn't believe it. I think I might. Okay, Buster, it's just a joke to you, huh? Well, what's it to you? This is a pretty silly job you're doing, you know. Never mind. At least I could enjoy throwing you out if I had to. <laughs> you're pretty funny yourself. <laughs> you think I'm a little out of my class here, huh? Well, you want to make a little side bet on what you decide to do after you talk to her? Or on whom is liable to get killed by who? <laughs> oh, go take your bath. Come on, Brooksy. Oh, these crispy crunches. I just love them for breakfast, don't you? Sure, sure, Mrs. Fairchild. Just adore them. I'm saving the box tops, you know. Not much left for a poor little lady like me to do. People don't realize. Uh, we only wanted to know about Mr. Sinclair. Yeah, and then we'll leave. Quickly. Oh, no. You stay and talk to me. That's what you'll do. Soon as I finish my breakfast, we'll all have coffee. 
Uh, about your complaint regarding Mr. Sinclair, uh, just... Oh, Mr. Sinclair, you know, he's an awful man. He's simply awful. And poor dear Mr. Liggett worries about it so. I tell you, sometimes parties down there last until 11 or 12 at night. Sounds pretty sinful. Mm-hmm. I beg your pardon? Young man, you're not defending. Oh, no, 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 of course not. But uh, he himself doesn't drink, apparently. Oh, no. They're not that kind of parties. And this place is of thick carpets and heavy construction. I can't imagine you can hear much from down there, can you? Uh, for instance, his radio was playing just a second ago, but uh, I, I don't hear it now, do you? Oh, but you can hear it with a glass on the floor. What? Well, you put a glass on the floor and put your ear down against the glass. Didn't you ever do that? Well, for the love of... Oh, oh, aren't you old enough maybe yet to admit it? Well, here I'll show you. Uh, I'm sorry, lady, but that doesn't... Oh, will it just take a minute? Never mind. Uh, come on, Angel, we're getting out of here. I, I want to go down and knock on the wooden head of that landlord. No, wait. I'm showing you. Oh, my, and the things I can hear. Aren't you interested in that? Things about the underworld? Here, help me, I'm... I'm not very steady. I'll bet they talk mostly about women. Mrs. Fairchild, I wouldn't care if they talked in pig Latin to the ghost of Julius Caesar. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm dear. sorry, dear. You you don't care that he's liable to wring my neck? Is that it? Uh, here, 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 sit down again. Uh, I'm sorry, but frankly, Mrs. No, Fairchild... no, I'm all right. Yes, wring my neck. Now, I know it's silly, but it is exciting, don't you think? And, and for a lonely woman, there's so, so little excitement. George, catch her. Oh, she was wobbling on you. Something was wrong with her. George, I'll phone Lickett to get a doctor. Skip it. Hmm? She didn't faint. She's dead. Doc, hurry it up, hurry it up. The rest of the crew will be here in a minute. She was just talking to us, Lieutenant. And... I know, and down she went. Well, at her age, what do you... Nothing to do with it. Huh? It was the milk, not age. That's my first guess. Smells like it. What do you mean, Doctor? She was only eating cold cereal. And milk, milk, milk. <laughs> with enough poison in it to kill off a herd of buffalo. Whole bottles that way. And it must have been delivered early this morning and sat outside her door where practically anybody Things could have got... about the underworld. Yeah? What she heard. She was a snoop. I wonder if she really did hear anything important, Brooksy. What she heard might have been the reason for this, you mean? Hey, hey, where are you going? To bring a guy up here, Johnson. A guy who just might have been kidding about something he really meant. <laughs> George, uh, oh. Hello? You coming to see the great side better, too? Yeah, ring the bell, will you? That's what I'm doing. Your eyes bad or something? I'm in a hurry, that's all. Here, here let well, me... I get... don't hear the bell. What did he do? Disconnected or something? A little disconnected himself. You a friend of Sinclair's, Buster? The name's Hale, if you don't mind. Hale, but not hearty. He doesn't have any friends. I'm a new lawyer. I collect debts for him. I'm crazy. So am I. So is he. Got more people owing him money than the Department of Internal Revenue. He thinks it's funny. He thinks everything's funny. Yeah, well, there's a little matter upstairs you might not laugh off. Sinclair, where are you? Hey! He must have gone out, George. He's certainly... Hey, where you are, lady? What? His office is in the bathroom. The bathtub. Yeah, well, (laughs) excuse me. What are you talking about? Telephone, reading stand, cigar and all. Yeah, on the radio. Only it's not playing now, is it? Holy mackerel. Don't touch him. Yeah, side bed himself, taking a bath. But here, help me, the guy... You can't help him, he's dead. And he didn't just drown, either. When a radio is fixed like this and falls into a bathtub, 
It's called electrocution. Turn to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Listen to the difference. Yes, now you can actually hear authentic scientific proof of the difference between new RPM motor oil and premium type motor oils as designated by the American Petroleum Institute. Auto engines are equipped with irradiated piston rings. And during operation, minute particles of radioactive metal wear off the rings. Geiger counters are thus able to detect the amount of wear actually taking place. Listen now as the Geiger counters click off the difference. First, the low wear rate of the new RPM. Now, the much faster wear rate of the conventional oil. Now, new RPM again. You have just heard authentic scientific proof that new RPM motor oil cuts in half the wear rate of critical engine parts, doubles the life of the average auto engines between major overhauls due to lubrication. Proved in the laboratory and checked out in severe road service, new RPM motor oil is sold with a money-back guarantee of satisfaction. Ask for it at standard stations and independent Chevron gas stations where they say and mean we take better care of your car. Back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. If you want good luck, then knock on wood. That's what Mr. Liggett does, the proud owner and manager of the beautiful Golden Tower Apartments. And look at the luck it brings him. The woman in 16A, Mrs. Fairchild, is killed by poison. And now, only a few minutes later, another of his tenants, a slightly different sort of person known as Side Bet Sinclair, is dead too, on the 15th floor. Only this wasn't a poisoning. If your name is George Valentine, the way you'd put it is that when a radio is fixed like this and falls into a bathtub, it's called electrocution. It's called murder, you mean. Well, where is it? Through here, Johnson. Here we are. That's what it was, all right, Lieutenant. Radio falling in a tub gives a shock big enough to kill off a herd of buffalo. You're repeating yourself, Doctor. You said that about Mrs. Fairchild's poison. Still true. Oh, not that you could get that many buffalo into a bag. All right, all of you, clear out. Oh, is that man dead? Not you, Doc. Stay there. I just phoned for an extra crew to help you. I just want to know. Come on, everybody, please. Nothing to be curious about. This is the building we live in. What's going on? We certainly deserve an explanation. Did any of you see anybody come into Mr. Sinclair's room in the last quarter hour? All right, then. All right. It's all under control. Nothing for anybody to worry about. That's it, that's it. We'll call on any of it that we need. That's it. You'd better get that lawyer, though, Lieutenant. Mr. Hale, that friend of Sinclair. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, take care of it, Sergeant. Oh, brother, what a day this is turning out to be. No sooner one take happens... Easy, it... Johnson. It's all under control, nothing to worry about. Valentine, I admire your courage, but there isn't time for sarcasm. Why not? These two deaths are certainly linked up together, aren't they? Of course, of course they are. Simple as a Chinese puzzle. A snoopy little woman and a big-time gambler. <laughs> I'm just surprised they weren't both murdered the same way. Now you're doing it. Okay, Johnson, but uh, look at what you know so far. The old lady did hear things, maybe, from Sinclair's apartment here. And Sinclair himself must have certainly had enemies. So Sinclair was up to something and Mrs. Fairchild heard it and it was so important that the person who was involved killed both of them. Sure, sure. Well, it doesn't make much sense, does it, George? Sinclair was too smart to go yelling about things and she wouldn't have understood anything she heard anyway. Well, they're tied up together in some way. Both done in by the same crackpot, if you ask me. Huh? Who let you in? Oh, hello. Uh... The janitor, Lieutenant. Name's Newton. Your sergeant called me. Only I got work I should be doing. Every fuse box in the whole place blown out. You know that? Lucky you didn't catch the whole building on fire. That's Sinclair. And Wait a minute. What did you say about a crackpot? Just what the other tenants are saying out in the hall. Nice, peaceful place until you got here. Everything neat and clean. Well, it's obvious, isn't it? 
Some madman or lunatic. Well, don't wave your finger at me. I'm not going to argue with you. Well, I am. Uh, Newton, who delivers the milk here? What? Uh, facts, come on. Uh, who delivered a bottle of Dutch Farm Guernsey to Mrs. Fairchild's door upstairs? Same man's done it for ten years. Who do you think? I've already started on that line through the dairy, Valentine. Name's Frank something. Makes a lot of deliveries in the building. Too dumb to be mixed up in anything. Uh, you see him come in? Of course I did. I see everybody come in. You what? You heard me. Nightman's been sick the past week. I've been on duty. Where? Lobby. Propped up in a chair right next to the elevator. Well, whom did you see? When... Nobody. Milkman, that's all. What of it? Inside. Somebody from inside. Uh-huh, maybe. And the milkman's probably all right. So somebody must have tampered with that milk in the hall after he delivered it. Lunatic. Crackpot. And today, maybe the same person came in here and gave Sinclair's radio a shove. Only that'd have to be somebody you could come in with without surprising him, right? He always left the door open. Well, that's not what I mean. Somebody who knew his habits, that's all. Like the other. Somebody right here from this building. From it? You mean in it, don't you? In it. Right now. <laughs> Now, look, Mr. Valentine, I can't help you tie these two things together. You're trying to add sheep and goats. That fair child From you, woman... I, I just want to know about Sinclair, Mr. Hale. Well, Lieutenant Johnson just ran past me there in the hall, and he didn't ask Well, you. he decided he'd better run a fast check of the other tenants. Mr. Liggett's with him. People hated side bet. I told you that. Uh, a lot of characters in debt to him, huh? Sure, with plenty of reason to kill him. Self-defense, practically, for anybody to kill Sinclair. A very unpleasant man. Gambler who always collected had a smile like a death warrant. You're his lawyer. You should know. Uh, just got the job, miss. Big money. I'm a man with ideals. A uh, big money, sure. Yeah. But uh, stay on the rails. Any of those characters in the building in trouble with Sinclair? You mean any of them live here? No, I don't think so. And if one of them did do it, how do you explain that woman upstairs? He who... doesn't yet, Mr. Hale. One thing at a time. No, uh, both things at once. Stubborn type, isn't it? I don't believe in crackpot killings. There's a neat, simple explanation for everything. Hey, Mr. Yeah. Valentine! Mr. Valentine! Oh, it's Mr. Liggett, George. Uh, uh, right here. Uh, yeah. uh, 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 Mr. Valentine, 16A, 15A. What's your trouble, friend? Uh, what am I going to do? My whole uh, life, my building... What about 16 and 15A? Uh, uh, get your breath, will you? Uh, I thought you were Johnson. Uh, I came to get you. He's downstairs in 14A. There's another woman there. Dead. The woman in 14A, who was she? The woman, that's all. There's no possible connection. She's a school teacher, Mr. Hale, and she lives here. Hey, hey, wait a minute. Uh, the elevators are down this way. No, no, no. This is faster. You don't have to wait. Just straight ahead. It's the way we went before. But what happened to this woman? What did she... Strangled. Just a few minutes ago. She'd just gone to answer her door, apparently, and someone was there. And it happened. A few minutes ago, I tell you, uh, there's someone... Come, in the... Calm down, will you, Leggett? Uh, here. This door. What? What's this? Fire stairs? Yes. Yes. Come on, come on. Be careful of the railing. Hold it. Go on, Valentine. The stairs are too Wait, narrow. Said, stop, both of you. Yes, but Lieutenant Johnson is... He, he'll live without us for a second. You like the view or something? You're trying to make yourself dizzy looking down? Skip it, Hale. I used these stairs before. Now, this is an inside fire escape, isn't it? Only those doors to it aren't locked. Well, not in a building like this. Where does it end? That's what I'm trying to see. At the back hall, uh, by the alley. Is that door locked? Down there, I mean. Well, no, as a matter of fact. Oh, for heaven's sake, Valentine, at a time like well, this... Somebody what? could have come in this way last night, couldn't he? To climb up here and tamper with some milk without being seen... And down below, Newton in the lobby by the elevators wouldn't have seen him. All right, you solved it. Now let's get okay, out. Okay, let's let's move. Three murders, all in a row. You think he'll stop at three? Oh, be quiet, both of you. 
I can't stick it. Liggett, what are the rest of the facts on this? Oh, uh... leave him alone. He's knocking on wood to stop a force. Please, I said. A concrete place like this, he'll have to use his own head. For oh, time. stop it. Stop it. Don't talk like that. Uh, maybe you're right. Maybe there will be a fourth murder. Uh, what's it? No, there won't. There can't be. Lieutenant Johnson has more police coming. They'll be here any minute. Wait, Mr. Hill. Don't push. But isn't this the door to the next floor? It isn't marked. Neither are the apartments, I noticed. Just A, B, or C. But of course it's 14. Come on, hurry up. I like it better here. So do you guys. Besides, whatever fourth murder there is, is liable to be right here, isn't it? What did you say? Oh, come on. Let's keep on moving downstairs. But this is the floor. Mr. Liggett, you're liable to be the fourth corpse unless you shut up. Bravo. Listen, I'm not interested in that third one. Because that's a murder that'll convince everyone forever that these are some sort of madman killings. Right? Three in a row running right down a building? Of course it's madman. Yeah. But what did you say? So suppose you... instead it was just a brutal, cold-blooded job to make people think that. Well, come on, downstairs. Here. Yeah. Mr. Valentine, yeah, this uh, woman was strangled, though. I'm interested in that. There are tests they can run, you know, on a man's hands. They can do it soon enough. Will you please explain what you're talking about? Mr. Liggett, you're a superstitious guy, aren't you? Knock on wood. And you own this building. For the love of... I'm what... making sense, friend. Just like this fire well does. Meaning that an outsider could be the murderer. Meaning me? Well, so could anyone who lived in the building or owned it. I don't or... think so. Hale, uh, your so-called client Sinclair had an ulcer, didn't he? I guess he might have had milk delivered every night, too. Seems logical. People who plan a killing by poison usually don't make mistakes, I know, but they could if they didn't live here. If you walked up these steps last night, for instance, and counted as you walked and made a mistake and discovered it today and corrected it by killing Sinclair... You pretended you were just going into his place, Hale, when we bumped into you there. Easiest thing to do, I guess, if you're caught just in your way out. Liggett, what would you think of a detective? Oh, be quiet. Sit down. Yeah, well, I'll just sit here. On the 12th floor landing. Yeah. 16, 15, 14, 12. Well, you know, you know, it's so difficult to rent. Many Yeah, I know, but, uh... Hale here didn't. Counted the floors and ended up one floor too high. Put poison in the wrong bottle. Mrs. Fairchild's. <laughs> didn't skip 13. No, 13th floor. Should have knocked on one. Yeah, yeah. What's that? Oh, some of those extra policemen, I guess. <laughs> Maybe there's a lab man with him, Hale. We can... Sit and wait for that test I talked about. You're saying I did it. Any number of people could have... All right, we'll, uh... We'll... We'll wait for the proof. Ridiculous. We will not. I'm getting out of here. Yeah, Mr. Valentine, don't let Get him go. Get out of my I'll... way, or I'll... No, 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 Buster. You, uh... You wouldn't pull another desperation murder with all those witnesses coming up, would you? I said... Oh, all right, all right. Just just take it easy. No, he can get out in the hall. He can take the elevator to another floor. Why, he can... Oh, no, he can't. The elevator won't work. What? What do you mean... Of course it'll work. Uh-uh. No, it's it's an electric elevator, isn't it? Now, don't get sore, Hale. You did it yourself, you know. It, it was your murdering Sinclair half an hour ago that, well, as Newton put it, blew out every fuse box in the joint. <laughs> it's a little ironic, isn't it? George, how did you guess there wasn't any 13th floor in that building? That's quite common, Angel. Keep your eyes open. Notice the elevator, the elevator buttons next time. Only, uh, uh, maybe you won't notice if you climb up the fire stairs. Well, I don't understand how Hale could have... Well, on Mrs. Fairchild, he made a mistake. Oh. Wrong floor, wrong bottle of milk. Seems, uh, he was the one who owed Sinclair all that money. And he was afraid for his own neck, so he decided to kill him. Next day, he did. Only we practically caught him at it without knowing. Well, you didn't act nervous or anything. Hale was desperate, Brooksy. Yeah, we we would have found out it was a mistake in pretty short order, you know. So he slipped off and committed another murder just to cover... Sure, the bloodhounds would have gone off in the opposite direction fast. Maniac on the loose. 
No time to look for rhymes or reasons. But he wasn't nervous or anything. I mean, I noticed he got lost in the shuffle there for a few minutes, too, but I... Well, why does a murderer have to act like one? People don't always betray themselves, you know. They don't spill their emotions all over the place. They don't spill their emotions all over... Oh. Well, some people certainly don't. I don't know why you always expect them to. You don't think I'm going to rise to that, do you? Well, I can sit here just as cold-blooded and showing nothing. You sure, Angel? For just about that long every time. Never longer. I hope. Knock on wood. When you're out driving on the highway, there's nothing like having a clean windshield and a clean rear window every mile of the way. For clear vision, ahead and behind means greater driving comfort as well as greater personal safety. And helping you have clear vision is the speedy service offered to you at all standard stations and independent Chevron gas stations. Here you'll notice the men take pride in doing a thorough spick and span job on your windshield, and they're, they're glad to offer you this service whenever you want it with no obligation on your part. Windshield care is but one of a number of car saver services that are given as a regular procedure at these gas stations. Use them every day, and every day you'll enjoy your motoring. And remember, you're never far from an independent Chevron gas station or a standard station where they say and mean we take better care of your car. <laughs> Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard Oil Company of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West. Owing to the illness of Robert Bailey, the part of George was played tonight by Ken Peters. Virginia Gregg is Brooksy. Let George Do It is written by David Victor and Jackson Gillis and directed by Don Clark. Ken Christie's Lieutenant Johnson. John McIntyre was heard as Hale. Howard McNear as Liggett. Jeanette Nolan as Mrs. Fairchild, Joe Duvall as Sinclair, and Fred Howard as Newton. The music is composed and presented by Eddie Dunstetter. Your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. Let George Do It is heard overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Welcome back. I found that uh, story about the 13th floor being missing uh, from a lot of buildings fascinating. I can't say that it was uh, my experience, uh, but uh, I've never been in a ton of 13-story uh, buildings. Um, so, I, uh, so I'm perhaps not the greatest uh, expert on that. But uh, a, a solid conclusion to the case anyway. All right, well, now we turn to listener comments and feedback. Cynthia says, You mentioned on one of the Detectives podcasts that most people who have heard the reruns in the 60s and 70s. I grew up listening to reruns in the 90s. My dad was blind and would often listen to books on tape and radio. When I was five, we lived in Southern California. Uh, and Can Canx 1070 uh, always played old-time radio programs at nine. I grew up with many of the wonderful programs that you've made available. My dad died last uh, year in September, and I'm really enjoying listening and remembering uh, those years. Uh, there was one program that I can't remember the title of. It was about King the Dog and Mounted Policemen in the Yukon. Have you heard of it or anyone who has those in podcast form? Uh, I be uh, the series you're looking for is Challenge of the Yukon and... Andrew Rines uh, does that as part of his Old Time Radio Westerns podcast, otrwesterns.com. And I should uh, add that uh, Old Time Radio is definitely not uh, dead among the visually uh, impaired uh, community. A lot of people uh, still listen. In fact, if you go into um, uh, iTunes on their spoken word section, there is an Old Time Radio uh uh, channel that I believe was put out exclusively uh, by the uh, American uh, Council of the Blind. 
under the radio station link. Finally, we have this from Jim. Uh, Thanks for doing such a fine job of presenting these radio shows and uh, fleshing them out with information not easily accessible. Uh, I've been listening to a few uh, f- for a few years now up in Spokane, Washington, and cannot go a day without uh, downloading one of your programs. Thanks again. Keep up the great work from Jim. Well, thanks so much, Jim. Appreciate your support and uh, you listening in Spokane, the city of my father's birth, as well as my youngest brother. So, all right. Well, that will do it for. Uh, Today, we'll be back tomorrow with Sherlock Holmes. Uh, In the meanwhile, you can send your comments, Box13 at GreatDetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. And give us a call, 208-991-4783. But from Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.